Thank you for joining us on The Tiger and Lawyers, Guns and Money, which we do with Ben Hart from Integrity Legal. Ben, we've uh, bought the rights to Warren Zevon's Lawyers, yeah. Guns and Money. <laughs> a lot of people mention that song to me when, when, I, when I see them because they say, because I, I, a lot of people more and more mostly come upon me on YouTube via this platform and they say, oh, yeah, do you like that song? And I said, I'll, I'll tell you. When he first told me the title of that, I didn't even, I hadn't even heard of the song, so. Somebody yeah. uh, complained that we hadn't got rights to use the name from Warren Zevo. All we can say is the three words, actually the four words, yeah. are not copyrighted themselves. Right. And we never have played even a single note right. of Lawyers, Guns and Money. Which is a fantastic da, 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 song. Da, 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 yeah. da. It's a good song. It just, yeah. We like the name. We like the name. Uh, okay, so we're talking about embassies. Mm -hmm. So um, what we're just going to quickly revisit mm -hmm. one of the misconceptions a lot of foreigners have mm -hmm. about embassies before we talk about the modern embassies and how they've changed over the past 10 or 20 years. And that is the one where we see in the Hollywood movie the uh, p police of a certain country chasing a, a foreign national right. and he's running towards the embassy, usually with a bit of slow motion, yeah, yeah. stumbling and then getting up as they're getting closer and just getting to the gate right. and he's safe. Yes, yeah. That's not the way it works. No, not really. I think a couple of movies, I think there was one, Red Corner, with uh, Richard Gere, and then there was... Uh, ah, yes. Uh, the Saint, if you go back... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Which, Val which Kilmer, the Val Kilmer one. Val okay. Kilmer one, where Elizabeth Shue goes running into the embassy, and she gets caught by the Marine Guard. Yeah, that, that's not how it goes. Um, it, you know, if you're in a country as a foreign national, a U.S. national, and, and look, uh, let me be clear, the Americans do provide certain consular services to their foreign nationals abroad. Uh, if you do get arrested, they will liaise with, with, for example, the Thai government just so they know where you're at and they'll make sure that you're not being abused. Can, can we play that out? I get to, I'm an American citizen, I mm. get through the gate mm. and I'm inside. Mm. Can the Thai police walk through the gate and grab me and uh, take no, me? No, I, no. So, um, so you are protected a little bit. There's going well, to be a bit of argy-bargy. I mean, but, but the... the, the they would not let that happen. The yeah, it, it, we could get very deep into extraterritoriality, and because it, it, this is another misconception, the embassy is not what people think it is. The embassy is the people. It's sort of like talking about a church. A church isn't a building. It's the people in the church. The embassy is not the building. The building is the chancery, and that's the actual housing of the people and the functions of that embassy. The embassy is actually the people. So in a sense. Yes, there's what's called extra. T in, there's also this misconception that, oh, that's my soil. That's U.S. soil. No, that's that's Thailand, but it has extraterritoriality where they are immune on that property. They are operating as America on that property. But, yeah, you as an individual, if you just go running on there, they may even push you back out. You know, <laughs> yeah. so the... Um, Take your passport if you are yeah, going to. It's, it's, it, 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 we're getting into some very kind of murky areas because sure. when you're talking about sovereignty and plenary power, it, it can get it can get very it gets very gray. But long story short, if you no, you can't just go running onto embassy compound the way that you would do that. The the other big misconception we talked about in another video, if you get arrested in Thailand, the embassy is not sending down a lawyer to defend you. That's not what they do. They will check on you. They'll make sure you're there. I've seen them do it. I've, I've had clients that have been in lockup, uh, and mostly in the remand prison here in Bangkok that I've been dealing with with the Thai attorneys. You don't want to be in the remand prison, no. by the way. Remand is no. arguably a little bit better in certain ways Only than slightly. Klong Prem, yeah. um, mostly because there's usually less people. Uh, but neither is any place you want to be. No. Um, the so the the real misconception is that they're going to come down and be your advocate. Or, no, that's not their job. They're just going to check on you, make sure you're there. They're going to report back to anybody you tell them, you ask them to report back to that. Hey, this person's there, and then they'll probably give you a list of lawyers. We're on the American Embassy list of lawyers, and they'll say you want to talk to somebody, go talk to them. But we don't provide legal services. That's that's a major misconception as far as what they actually do, for sure. So if you're going to go in there, go in and grip onto the ambassador or the consul general so that you're actually holding onto somebody. <laughs> no, no, don't do that at all. No, no, no. Because no, you probably will be cited for assault and battery in your own country <laughs> right, on well, top of everything else. No, so, so no, don't how do have embassies changed? I know, for example, mm. uh, in the, the Australian 
embassy now. They basically say, no, no, we don't want you to come here. Mm -hmm. Go to mm -hmm. our service centre, which is actually only uh, two mm -hmm. or three roads across from here. And I think it's a service shared with Canada and the US or the UK as well. US doesn't outsource any of that. Uh, okay. So it's probably UK. UK. It's probably VFS is what they're using. Oh, uh, it's one of those. But you walk yeah. in there, there's hundreds of windows and mm -hmm. you're just a number and yes, next. Mm -hmm. And it's a person and you go, nah, 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 and they go, what? Mm. <laughs> you go through all that kerfuffle. Right, right. So I've, I think these days uh, the embassies, of, the services they actually provide mm. are quite different from what they used to provide, say, 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah, it's it's pretty truncated uh, compared to what it was. I'll, I'll give you a really perfect example. When I first started doing U.S. immigration, uh, when we would get what are called uh, 221Gs in U.S. immigration cases, which is a refusal pending further documentation, I used to go in personally and just respond to those. Now, that's all done by mail, and that's fine. I don't have any real problem with that. If I, if I get into something where it's a really complex really nettlesome issue of law i can make an appointment go down there and see them and and try to work it out i haven't had to do that in a very long time but the yeah the, the the overall functions of the embassy have been heavily heavily digitized i mean almost everything is done digitally uh, the american embassy now if it's a passport renewal um yeah you're, you're going to be doing all that by mail uh, for the most part uh, I, I will say, I, I have to say, for the first 10 years I was working out here, I used to be down at the embassy probably three to four times a month. It, it almost seemed like I was down there once a week uh, for one thing or another. Uh, this was especially the case when, in the American embassy when we had what was called USCIS was here. That was American immigration. You could actually file immigration cases oh. at, a, at a window here. That closed under Trump. And then um, the... I would, so I would be there a lot because I would have to go across the street to pay the fee, and I'd, I'd be inside the consular section. I have to say, I don't really blame them on a certain level for wanting to go digital on certain things because that place was like the DMV from hell. It, it was, it, and by DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles in America, where you go to get your driver's license renewed, it's like a bureaucratic, just you want to pull your hair out. And it's always, the DMV is always shown in, like, comedy shows. Yeah. As, it's as just, a sort of the typical bureaucratic. Yeah, thing. just, but, but honestly, my, my thing that I would, I, I remember, I've told people that work for the State Department, you couldn't pay me enough money to work behind that window because the people that would be in that waiting room they were really just tough to deal with. They would get themselves very worked up, and they, it was like they came in ready to be mad about something. And I get it. It's, it's frustrating to deal with these kind of bureaucratic processes. But, yeah, a lot of that has been digitized. One of the big things that they used to just have you come in and they deal with it in person was what were called the consular reports of birth abroad. And now they have a whole process where they sort of front load all the documentation. You still have to go in, but they want to front load it so that you fill everything out before you go and see them, essentially. And I think for a lot of people, that is, and, and that's kind of frustrating. In a U.S. immigration context, we also have this thing called the National Visa Center now, which is like you have to digitally upload documentation and things, and it takes them all this time to review it, and then they come back and they say, we want more, we want something different, and none of it, is spelled out in anywhere. They just kind of make it up as they go along. Um, I don't have a lot of problems with embassies. I've been around them for a long time. They, they're usually pretty good about doing what they need to get done. National Visa Center in the United States, I've made a few videos on this myself. Um, they're, they're not my favorite institution in the world, I'll put it that way. I can give you uh, 1991, I was in Chicago and I got mugged. Oh wow. And they took my money and my passport. Right. I was uh, a, a good, responsible traveller. I had the phone number uh -huh. of the uh, Australian, Australian embassy, embassy in yeah. the United States yeah. in, uh, in my pocket. Yeah. I still had that piece of paper. I called them. Mm -hmm. And within half an hour, they came down to the police station that I'd reported at. Mm -hmm. And they gave me $500. Wow. They said, within three days, we'll have a standby passport to you. Wow. And they made sure that I uh, had accommodation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they even, uh, a lady organised a change of clothes for me. Wow. Now, 
I thought, oh. wow, and I had to pay the five hundred dollars back. By right, the way. right, yeah, and, yeah. But that was fine. At least I was able to continue my journey. Right. Uh, they said, where are you going to next? We'll make sure your, pa- your new passport. Or it wasn't a passport. It's sort of a piece of paper that right. filled Travel in for letter. a passport. Yeah. Right. Was delivered to where I was going. Mm-hmm. I went. Great. So that situation has changed remarkably. Mm-hmm. So the service that was provided then gave me a bit of a false sense of security of what uh, embassies do. They don't do anything like that even slightly anymore. It hasn't been my, it, yeah, that hasn't been my experience on that level. Although, I mean, it depends. There, I've, I've, I have seen a high level of service in certain circumstances. And I don't, I don't know why it seemed high in certain circumstances and not so high in others. It might be because on a personal level, I haven't really needed to avail myself of the embassy services very much. The other thing people don't bear in mind is from the 90s to now, there, I got to imagine there's a ton more people abroad than there used to be. Oh, sure. You, you know, yeah, you much, just, much bigger business. Yeah, there's, there has to be far larger numbers of expats from these countries. I'm not trying to be an apologist. In my opinion, I think it would be, especially in America, we, we pay a lot of taxes and we have, we, it seems like they're always spending a billion dollars somewhere on something. But for the most part, I mean, the embassy here, it's been my experience. They do, they get done what they need to get done. I haven't, I haven't had any really overwhelmingly negative experiences with the embassy, but I do think people's perception of what the embassy is supposed to do is wildly out of whack with what they actually do. Sure. And uh, a shout out to the Consul General uh, in Phuket for Australia, uh, Matt, fantastic guy. <laughs> right. I'll obviously deal with them from time to time. <clears throat> the Australian ambassador to Thailand, uh, uh, less so. All oh, right, uh, right. Anyway, there you go. So, uh, Ben, thank you very much. Thank- oh, thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Thank you for your free advice. Yeah. We have to pay him a fortune. Yeah, I know. Um, But it is lawyers, guns and money. There's a whole playlist with different topics and you can uh, go there and spend a whole afternoon and check out the different shirts that we're wearing. Uh, But in the meantime, thank you for joining us on The Tiger. We look forward to seeing you next time.